بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back to this series on hell described It's our 13th lesson and today we speak about the drink of the people of hellfire following the discussion last time in the last session we had about the food of the people of hellfire so with food comes drink so that's why we move on to drink of the people of hellfire and thereafter that we have a section on how uh, different people uh, from earlier times especially how reading these verses would affect them so alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala al mab'uuthi rahmatan lil alameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd Again, we look at the Qur'an first for the description it has about the drink of the people of the hellfire. Then we will look at what the hadith say and what the commentators have, have explained these verses. As There's several verses actually that speak about the drink of the people in the hellfire. So the first verse is from Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Verse 54, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَشَارِبُونَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْحَمِيمِ <clears throat> So they will drink upon it, probably the food or whatever they try to eat, they'll be thirsty. So then they will have to then drink the boiling hot water, scalding water. Thereafter that in Surah Muhammad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 15, وَسُقُوا مَاءً حَمِيمًا فَقَطَّعَ أَمْعَاءَهُمْ They will be made to drink boiling hot water, which will then tear apart their insides, their intestines and other things. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Naba, verse 24, 25, They will not taste in there, they will not experience in there cold, nor drink coolness no drink there will be an extreme cold but that will be worse than a freezer it's punishing <clears throat> it's a punishment so they won't have any natural coolness we're sitting in this place it's a bit hot but you get these breeze you get this breeze that comes through and um, that provides a certain benefit so according to this verse it says they will not taste in it any coolness, nor any drink, except the scalding water and ghassaq. Now, we're not going to translate ghassaq here because we're going to discuss that later as to what exactly ghassaq refers to. There's a few different opinions as to what it refers to. So that's three verses so far. The fourth verse we're going to take from Surah Al-Sad, verse 57 and 58. Allah says, هَذَا فَلْيَذُوقُوهُ حَمِيمٌ وَغَسَّاقُ وَآخَرُ مِن شَكْلِهِ أَزْوَاجِ This and let them taste it the scalding water and the foul perilence that's how he translates it here but again we'll just wait for what غساق means because غساق is mentioned again and other punishments of its type so we have many other punishments وَآخَرُ مِن شَكْلِهِ أَزْوَاجِ we have many other types of punishments besides this so again, there's the hot water, boiling water, scalding water that's discussed again. Thereafter that, we've got two more verses. One is in Surah Ibrahim, verse 16 and 17. Similar, ma'un sadid. This is the water, the liquid, pus, and so on which they will be forced to try to push down and they'll hardly be able to do so. Thereafter that last verse we're going to quote today is from Surah Al-Kahf, verse 29. If they call out for some kind of assistance, some kind of drink, some kind of help that they need, they will be 
provided this liquid, kal muhl. It's going to describe what muhl is, which will boil, which will actually burn the faces. And what a bad drink, what an evil drink. What a horrible drink it is. And what a bad place to be in. So these are all the verses. What we learn from these four verses is that there are actually four types of drink that you could distinguish from these. Four types of drink. So let's discuss it as has been discussed by the Sahaba and others. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu is related from him that the Hamim. So the first one is Al-Hamim. Right? So there it's mentioned a few places. Al-Hamim, according to Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, is it is so hot that it will burn you. So it's a very, very hot liquid that will burn you. Likewise, Hassan and Suddi, they say the same thing, that Hamim is that which is at its intense level of heat. It can't be hotter than that, whatever that is. It can't be hotter than that. Now the limit in this world, I think scientists have discussed this. I can't remember what it is. Is it? I think Kelvin's are, when it goes down to the cooler side of things, Kelvin, right? And when it gets into the intense, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what they use. But anyway, this is what it is. This is in hellfire as well. So it's not even of this world that there's no limitations in, in the here. I mean, the limitations are much. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if there's any limitations in hellfire. Whatever it is. Thereafter, that Dahak, who's another uh, mufassir, he says they will be given to drink from such water or liquid, whatever it is, which has been being boiled. Since the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth until the day that they will be fed it and it will be poured over their head. I mean, what is there going to be left if it's something that's just been constantly on the boil? Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, see, when we have min hamimin an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, min hamimin an. So, what is this an that Allah adds? Hamimin an. So, he says that. Hamim in An means which has gone to the intense level of the boil. That's one opinion. The other opinion is Hamim in An, it is boiled and ready to drink. Meaning this is as much as it can be boiled. When you want to boil something to its intense level, as in this world, and now it's ready, that you can't boil it any further. It's a waste of time to boil it any further. It says Hamim in An. So it's An means it's ready. It's ready. So <clears throat> that's why also you have in the Quran min ainin aniya again the concept of an which means it's ready that was the first word we have hamim hamim was the first word and it's just really boiling intensely boiling water the second one is ghassaq which we promised that we'll describe again Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu comments on that and he says it's Ghassaq is ma yasilu min bayni jild al-kafiri wa lahmihi that which will be flowing from between the flesh and the skin of a disbeliever so when they're punished with this intense heat and so on it's whatever fluids will flow from in between the skin and the flesh that's one opinion there's another opinion there's two things that this ghassaq could be it could be this this perilent waste, human waste, human pus and so on or whatever the liquids are. The second opinion is ghassaq means az-zamharir al-barid alladhi yuharriku min bardihi. It's actually this intense coal that we've discussed earlier because paradise, sorry, hellfire will have this element in there, will have a section in there where the punishment will be intense cold. Like I don't know, they're using nitrogen or whatever it is to cool that, it's going to be really cold. You know, when you go into a butcher shop, they have, they have these cold rooms with these big doors. And you obviously don't want to get stuck in one of those. Inside, hey, I feel really hot. Let me go in there. Let me cool down. I remember I went to a friend's shop and he has a cooler room. And he says, come in the hot weather and then you'll see the benefit of the, you know, you can go in there and relax for a while. I mean, come on, subhanAllah. You have to wear special gloves to touch the stuff in there. That's how cold it is in these really intense. It's very intense. So this place is like they're in hellfire to punish people with extreme cold. So ghassa could mean either of these things. It could mean the, the pus and so on that flows or it could mean this intense cold. 
Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, he said, Ghassaq is this really thick pus and so on. And it is so toxic that if just a drop of it was to be poured or dropped into the east of the world or the west of the world and the other side would feel the stench of it. That's how bad it is. Just reek. The, the whole world would reek of this stuff. Mujahid says Ghassak. He takes the other meaning. He says that it's something that they would... It's so cold that they won't be able to taste it. They won't be able to... Because it's so cold, they won't be able to taste it at all. Kaab says Ghassak is... He, he, he's, he reckons that it's actually a stream, some kind of stream, some kind of liquid flowing source in Jahannam from which the poison of every poisonous creature in hellfire, which means the snakes and the scorpions and anything else that is there, that is where it, it will all gather. And then a person will be brought. So this is another type of punishment in the hellfire. A person will be brought and they will be dipped in there just once. And they will come out. And it's so toxic, this stuff, is that all of his flesh would have fallen off. The skin and flesh would have literally just disintegrated and fallen off the bones. And it will all, it's saying that it will just kind of melt and fall off and it will all be gathered by their feet by their ankles, this is like just completely off. And then when the person is walking in a skeleton almost, they'll be dragging this stuff behind them. They'll be dragging their flesh and skin behind them. I don't even know how they're still alive, but it's like in the here, I mean, this would kill you. There'd be nothing left. Like, but there in hellfire, Allah causes the life to continue and the punishment to be experienced. So, again, it's not as simple as, okay, I'll be thrown into the hellfire. How long am I going to last for? I mean, it's so severe. How long am I going to last for? It's going to be finished. It won't be finished. This is the problem. There's quite a few descriptions of this ghassaq. It seems to be quite a bad thing. That's why there's a hadith that Imam Hakim, Imam Ahmad, and Imam Tirmidhi have transmitted from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that لَوْ أَنَّ الدَّلْوًا مِنْ غَسَّاقٍ يُحْرَاكُ فِي الدُّنْيَا لَأَنْتَنَ أَهْلَ الدُّنْيَا If just a bucket of this غَسَّاق was to be poured into the world, there'd be a... St- everybody in this world would be reeking of this stuff. It, it would be very, very bad for everybody in the world. Another version from Bilal ibn Sa'ad says that if a bucket of this was put into the world, placed in the world, the toxicity of it would probably kill everybody. Everybody would die. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu <clears throat> and Mujahid, regarding the verse in Surah Al-Naba that we just covered earlier, لا يذوقون فيها بردا ولا شرابا that they will not experience in there any coolness nor drink إلا حميما وغساقا except boiling scalding water and غساق. So he takes that as relating to the first part. They won't have any coolness or drink. So coolness except ghassaq, that's the only kind of coolness they'll find, which was intense cold. And they won't find any drink in there except boiling water. So he, pr- he tries to prove by this that ghassaq actually is that intense cold. Others have said that ghassaq is actually not an Arabic word. It's a, a foreign term that's been brought in, and it actually means extreme cold. But anyway, either way, some others say, no, it is an Arabic word from ghassaq, which ghasik, as Allah says in the Quran, ghasik is the night, something which overwhelms. So it's the darkness, whatever it is, it's bad enough. Either way, whether it's intense cold or whether it's the pus and blood and the other bodily fluids, whatever it is, it's bad enough. So those are two things that will be available to drink and people will drink it. They'll have to because they'll think that they'll get some kind of satiation out of it because they'll be very hot and intense. And then this is the experience. So the first one was Hamim, which is extremely boiling water, and there is this. Now the third one is the Sadeed. The Sadeed, Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, um, This one is quite clearly bodily fluids, pus and blood. So Qatada, 
uh, when he comments on this, he says, whatever flows from a person's body when they've got some kind of disease or punishment or whatever it is. And that's why Allah says, يَتَجَرَّعُهُ وَلَا يَكَادُ يُسِيغُ They'll be trying to ingest this because they need something to drink. They're feeling very, very thirsty. Their body is calling for it, so they're just looking for whatever it is, but they won't be able to put it down. It'll just be completely, completely horrible. So Qadada then says, هَلْ لَكُمْ بِهَذَا He says, do you think you can be, do you think you'll have patience to bear this? طَاعَةُ اللَّهِ أَهْوًا عَلَيْكُمْ يَا قَوْمْ فَأَطِيعُ اللَّهُ Instead of that, it's much easier, much more comfortable. It's di- it might be difficult, you may see it as difficult, but he says, compared to that, the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much easier for you to do so that you can, be, you can avoid that. So, oh people, so obey Allah and His Messenger. Stop doing that, otherwise you'll have to deal with that. It's much easier than to have to go through that difficulty. It's easier to go through the difficulty of avoiding some harams and uh, being steadfast and perseverant on whatever good deeds that we have to do that may prove to be difficult in some cases. Imam Ahmad and Imam Tirmidhi then have a hadith from Abu Umama radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about this verse, وَيُسْقَى مِن مَّاءٍ صَدِيدٍ يَتَجَرَّعُ He explained it. He says, يُقَرَّبْ إِلَى فِيهِ فَيَقْرَعُ This will be brought close to his face. And he will try to drink it, but it will, because it's so, you know, it's so hot that you can hardly even take it close to your face because it's letting out so much heat. So it will roast his face. Now, he has to drink it. Either by force, he'll he'll be forced by his own desire for drinking something to drink it or whatever the reason. That will then go down and when it does go down, it will actually tear everything apart. Until eventually it will come out of his anal tract. From his backside essentially. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Muhammad, وَسُقُوا مَاءً حَمِيمًا فَقَطَّعَ أَمْعَاءَهُمْ They will be made to drink this boiling hot water which will tear up their insides. Now if it's the insides are tear, torn up, where is it going to go? It's going to come out. Allah. And Surah Al-Kahf, وَإِن يَسْتَغِيثُوا يُغَاثُوا بِمَاءٍ كَالْمُهْلِ يَشْوِ الْوُجُوهُ بِئْسَ الشَّرَابِ وَسَأَتْ مُرْتَفَقًا so we are discussing the sadid. it carries on. There's a hadith actually in Sahih Muslim from Jabir radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna ala Allahi ahdan liman sharibal muskirat. You know, there's a lot of people today who think that drinking a, a glass of beer or a wine or something or a little champagne at a party, at a business meeting or something like that, how harmful can it be? I'm not addicted to this. I don't bring this stuff in the house. You know, I don't buy this stuff, but you know, it just to fit in. You're in the West, you have to do this kind of stuff. Otherwise, you might lose a deal or you may not, you you may look a bit extremist or I don't know, whatever the justification is. But seriously, this hadith should be known. This is a Sahih hadith from Muslim. Inna ala Allahi ahdan liman sharib al muskirat. And this is actually not just drink. This is not just wine and stuff. This is muskirat, anything that intoxicates. Anything that intoxicates. That means all the drugs and so on. Right? لِيَسْقِيَهُ مِنْ طِينَةِ الْخَبَالِ مِنْ طِينَةِ الْخَبَالِ It is binding on Allah, like Allah has made it binding on Himself. Allah has promised in this warning that anybody who drinks intoxicants, who ingests intoxicants, Allah will give them to drink from Tinatul Khabal. We've discussed Tinatul Khabal before. The Sahaba wondering, what is Tinatul Khabal? Because Tina comes from the concept of Teen, which means soil and Khabal. What is this, Ya Rasulullah? وَمَا تِينَةُ الْخَبَالِ قَالَ عَرَقُ أَهْلِ النَّارِ They'll be forced to drink of the perspiration, the gathered perspiration, sweat essentially of the people of hellfire. أو عصارة أهل النار or whatever is squeezed from their body. Whatever is squeezed from their body after all the punishment and everything. As we know from earlier hadith that there are pools in hellfire where all of these things. It's got a, seems like a very sophisticated system. That they have all of these things gather somewhere. The venom is gathered in one pit, in one reservoir. This 
bodily fluids is gathered in another reservoir and then that is used to then pump to other people. It's like its own system. A'udhu Billah, I mean, worse than any horror movie you could even imagine, I think this is. <clears throat> There's numerous hadith about this. I'm just going to mention a few. Imam Ahmad has transmitted another hadith and so has Ibn Hibban in his Sahih from Abu Musa. Al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Man mat. This is another one which supports the hadith in Muslim. Whoever drinks and he is mudminu khamr. He's somebody who's habit. In this one, it's mudmin, the one who drinks quite a bit. Right? Allah, saqahu allahu min nahri al-ghuta. Allah will give him, provide him, or will force him to drink from the lake of ghuta. Now, this is not ghuta to Sham. This is not the place in Sham. This place called ghuta there. Qila wa ma nahru al-ghuta. What is this lake? Of Ghuta, he said, Nahrun Yahruju min Furujil Mumisat, Yudhi Ahlan Nari Natnu Furujihim. I don't even know how to say this. I don't even know. How to, I mean, I know how to say it, but I'm horrified to even say this. This is a lake, a reservoir again, which is made up of all the, all the discharge of the private parts of the prostitutes. And the people of hellfire will be really, really horrified by the smell that comes from there. In this world, all of this scene is as beautiful, as attractive, as something that is difficult to avoid for people. But that is what's going to happen there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect. Make it easy because zina is so easy nowadays, so prevalent. There's people with wives, subhanAllah. There's people with wives and they're telling you that they have to go there to other places. So why? Because they're just not satisfied. They're not satisfied. Why aren't they satisfied? Why aren't they satisfied? Sometimes the women call and they say, this is what's happening at home. So it's like, why isn't anything going on? No, everything goes on at home. Like, you know, we do what we need to do. I mean, there could be children listening. That's why I'm not going into graphics. But we do. I'm, I'm, it's always available. So what is it? Well, primarily, I think it's to do with what they watch, which cannot be done at home because it's haram. So then they find, oh, that's why one beautiful dua for this that people who are struggling with this need to read, inshallah, very beneficial, is... اللهم اكفني بحلالك عن حرامك اللهم اكفني بحلالك عن حرامك واغنني بفضلك عمن سواك oh Allah just suffice me with the halal away from the haram like give me satisfaction give me sufficiency so that I'm happy and satisfied with the halal away from the haram and enrich me <clears throat> by your grace from everybody besides you so I don't I'm not in need of anyone else except you but well, that first part is very, very important. Say it in your own words, you know, even if you don't remember the Arabic. Oh Allah, give me satisfaction with the halal, so I don't have to worry about the haram. This works, this dua works for halal and haram wealth. That you've got a haram source, a halal source of income, there's a haram source, and you feel like going towards there because you're not satisfied with the halal. It's happening today so much. And haram sources are much easier to come by. Right? The, the, the most uh, common question that we're receiving today is, is Bitcoin halal? Is cryptocurrency? It's like everybody's wanting to do it. And the few conscious people are asking about it. Everybody else is just doing it. It's a difficult one. It's almost like uh, going to become a necessary evil. But right now, anybody who's until it stabilizes, people are, have got, those who are into it are like gamblers. And that's, that's what the studies are showing. So whether it's halal or haram in terms of it being a commodity or not, that's a separate question. But in terms of the people who are doing it, they're like day traders. And day traders uh, have a similar... They have a, they have a similar behavior to gamblers because it's all about a day trade. It's all about something hoping for it to go up, or go down. There's nothing, nothing solid there. It's not business. It's not really a business. Business is where you put something in, you invest something, you work hard, you expect profits. There's no working hard here. The only thing is that it's speculation. Everybody says it's this, it goes up, say, hey, it must be this. Some, some crazy prominent guy says something and it goes up. And if he says something else, it goes down. 
you're at the mercy of everybody else, right? Now that's, so in terms of the technicality, maybe halal, right? Um, there are two opinions about Bitcoin. Some ulama say it's halal, some say it's haram, the technical aspect. Maybe those who say it's haram, they, I know some of them are definitely see it as a form of gambling with a similar behavior, similar attitude. Should you do it? Should you not do it? Right? That, that's, that's the question now. Right? Eventually, if it becomes the norm, then there's probably going to be less fluctuation because it will become currency. You can't have a currency that fluctuates like that. Meaning, you can't have a sustainable currency that keeps fluctuating thousands, hundreds, or tens in a day or in, in, in over a week. How, 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 does, how do people use that as a currency? So right now, as you can see, it's, it's, while people do use, while some people are using it as a currency, and it is used as a currency, but I would probably say majority are not in there for its currency value. Some people are in there for currency value, like certain countries that are on sanction lists where they're able to buy things through. They're understandable. They're behind this because they think that the West is dominating the, <clears throat> the whole SWIFT transfer business and all of that, and they put sanctions on, and they have their own laws and that places like Russia and other countries. So they're behind it for that purpose. But a lot of the, the, the normal Joe on the street, he's there to make a lot of money in a very short amount of time. That's, that is a different issue. That is a very different issue. And of course, then some of them were specifically, explicitly designed uh, so that the underworld can work, so that they can be below the radar. They can deal in... Uh, black goods or black merchandise or unlawful merchandise or whatever not be tracked and so on. So you have to remember that. It's almost like a necessary evil eventually. When do you get into it? There's people who've made a lot of money and there's people who are going to lose a lot of money. La ilaha illallah. I think that's enough for anybody with some sense to understand that you'd rather pursue something which is solid for sure rather than spending your whole day waiting for it. How frustrating is that? How frustrating is that? You can understand you're waiting for some guest to come who's told you he's going to come. Okay, he's going to come within a few hours. You know, even in the, do the days when there was no phone, no texting, you know, I'm going to come on this day. Now, he could have come in the morning, he could come in the afternoon, he could have come. he's going to come eventually unless something bad happens. But in this one, you, there's no promise for anything. It's just all hope and speculation, right? where simple, small companies suddenly become so valuable because everybody's speculating on them. Those gaming companies that happened a few months ago. Right? What kind of world is that? That's why it's just a whole decentralized kind of aspect that there's no governance. Where, where is that going to really take you? Okay, there's some good aspects to that for some people, but when you don't have any kind of system in place, then it becomes really, really complicated because this world works on predictability. And I'm not saying that the current system is a good one, right? There are, while it is a system that's working and has been working, of course, there are people manipulating that system. And, you know, there's a, it's an empty system and there's some big bubbles even in the whole fiat money system and the leverage and everything. So maybe this is what the scholars were talking about when this started, when the whole fiat money started as well. And now it's going to be the same thing after 40 years. And then it's going to be something else. So initially they took away money uh, value from gold. So it was separated. It became thin air. It became just fiat money. And now they want to decentralize that even further. Right? Or take that away even further. So that it's, nobody's even able to do anything. What does that mean? That means while there's some good in it for some people, the evil is going to prosper even more in that regard. But anyway, let me stop here and carry on with our discussion here. Uh, Dahak mentions, now he's a tabi'i, he says once, <clears throat> Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is considered to be one of the biggest mufassirs of the Qur'an with Abdullah ibn Abbas. Once he got some silver ore, silver ore, and he had it melted. You know, when you melt silver ore, it becomes like liquid, right? Like a silvery liquid. <clears throat> so he, they had some silver in the Baytul Mal, in the national uh, repository. And he had it melted and then he had it sent to the masjid 
to show them and he says, okay, man ahabba an yanzura ilal muhl, fal yanzur ila the while it's still boiling, he sends it to the masjid. And he says, if anybody wants to see what muhl in hellfire is, look at this, this thick liquid. Imam Tabarani has related from Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said that law anna gharban ju'ila min hamimi jahannam if just one bucket, one pail of the hamim of jahannam was to be placed in the middle of the world somewhere, it would essentially, the smell of it and the intense heat of it would trouble everybody from the east to the west. I don't even understand how to fathom that. I can understand the smell, but how the heat of it with just one pail of it, I mean, how hot is that? Um, it has to be at least the intensity of the sun for that to happen. And then for you to feel it directly as well. From anywhere in the world, the rest of the people on the earth will smell. I mean, it's mind-boggling. I, I don't even know if you can understand this. Uh, Awza'i, Imam al-Awza'i, <clears throat> in his advices to Mansur, he says, Mansur, this must be the Abbasid Khalif, Mansur, I'm assuming. He gave him some advices. He wrote him, he says, Balaghani, it's reached me that Jibreel alayhi salam said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لو أن ذنوبا من شراب جهنم صب في ماء الأرض جميعا لقتل من ذاقه That if just one pail of the liquid of Jahannam, liquid of Jahannam means from probably any of those pits, was to be poured into the water of the world, the oceans or whatever, anybody who tasted that, it would become poisonous and they, they would die. They would die. It would kill it, kill them. One of the, our early people, they passed by this little village, which was known to have some wonderful grapes. And they used to make a lot of grape juice down there. It's a place between Kufa and Qadisiya in Iraq. Qadisiya and Iraq. These are two famous places in in Iraq. So he passed by the area. Its name is Tizanabad. Tizanabad. That's the name of the area. And um, they used to make a lot of wine. It looks like a lot of grape juice. And that's why wine was produced there. So I don't know. He just made a comment. He just said a couplet. Lines of poetry. He says, Bitizanabad karmun ma marartu bihi illa ta'ajjabtu mimman yashrabul ma. He said, in Tizanabad, there is such wonderful uh, vineyards, wine, uh, uh, vines, which means grapes, that when I passed it, I would be surprised if anybody drank water there. I mean, this, there's just an abundance of this uh, grape juice here. It's so wonderful as well. Why would anybody drink water? Right? So obviously, this is wine, right? So this is a problem. So then immediately he heard somebody say a sound whether that was from the unseen or from someone, he says, وَفِي جَهَنَّمَ مَاءٌ مَا تَجَرَّعُهُ حَلْقٌ فَأَبْقَى لَهُ فِي الْبَطْنِ أَمْعَا أَمْعَا So, yes, in Jahannam there is also a liquid that anybody that is forced to drink it, they will have in their stomach no intestines left. So drink this wine and that's what will happen to you. Now, this is... Uh, I don't know how horrified we are feeling, or we're so desensitized, or it feels so far away, or it sounds so inc extreme, whatever it is. But the next section is actually about the reaction to the food and the drink that's mentioned in the Quran about the people of Hellfire. This is the reaction from our predecessors. So I'll mention a few stories. For example, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, he would say, Al khawfu yamna'uni min akli ta'ami wa sharab fala ashtahi. At times he would say that the fear of hellfire, it prevents me from eating food and having drink. I just don't feel like having it. It's not like I feel like it, but I'm not going to have it. That I'm fasting or something. No, I just don't even feel like it. Now people who want to be on a diet, they're like, I wish I could feel like that. Maybe that's a diet we need to promote. Instead of that, like, only eat this. No, fear hellfire. Like, if you start fearing hellfire for like two weeks, you'll probably eat very, very less and you'll lose a lot of, a lot of weight. Right? Shu'ba, he relates from Sa'ad ibn Ibrahim. He says that once Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Now, it looks like a lot of them went through stages of this, bouts of this. Abdurrahman ibn Auf, radiallahu anhu, once, he was a billionaire 
whatever he wanted he could have had. He was brought his night, his, his dinner, and he had been fasting. So this is iftar time. He was fasting. Now, finally the food comes. And either he recited or somebody else recited from Surah Al-Muzzammil, verse 12, 13, which we've read before. Inna ladayna ankalan wa jahima wa ta'aman dha ghussatin wa athaban alima. So Allah is saying what he has in store for the people of Hellfire. He says, and we have food that is filled with thorns and a severe punishment. He just started crying and wouldn't eat until eventually the food had to be lifted. This is iftar time. He's been hungry all day. He did not eat even though he was fasting. You've got numerous stories like that. Ibn Abi Dunya has narrated from Hassan that a person met Another man, there's one man who met another person. He said, Ya hadha araq tagayyara lawnak. He saw him, he says, he knew him. He said, I see that your face is, your, the color of your face has changed. And you've become very emaciated. You've become very thin. What's going on? Are you on a diet? Today you'd say, are you on a diet? Depending on the face, you'd say, are you on a diet? And then they say, no, 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 I've had some issues in my life. Right? So, the, uh, then another person says, Yes, I've noticed this as well. What's going on? So he says, just three days. I've been fasting for three days. I've been fasting for three days, but every day that my iftar is brought to me, I think of this verse. يُسْقَى مِمَّا إِن صَدِيدٍ يَتَجَرَّعُهُ وَلَا يَكَادُ يُسِيغُهُ وَيَأْتِيهِ الْمَوْتُ مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ وَمَا هُوَ بِمَيِّتٍ He'll be bought boiling water. He will try to ingest it. He would not be able to ingest it. And then the death will come to him, or death will seem to appear to him from every place. Like it's just death, death, death. But he's not dead. Because behind him, there's severe punishment still to continue. There are other types of punishments to continue. So he says, I just can't eat. Um, for three days this is happening, I cannot eat. So then I wake up and I'm still fasting. And then again my food is brought and I'm unable to eat. One day Hassan radiallahu anhu, rahimahullah, he was fasting and again his iftar is brought. And he remembers his verse, إِنَّ لَدَيْنَا أَنْكَالًا وَجَحِيمًا وَطَعَامًا ذَا غُصَّةٍ وَعَذَابًا أَلِيمًا He says, take away this food. So he carried on. I mean, not supposed to really do that, but he's not fasting, to, sorry, he's not abstaining from food to fast, to carry on as a fast, thinking I'm rewarded for this. He just can't eat. I don't feel like eating. I don't feel like eating. So the next day when it's iftar time, it's the same thing. He says, just remove it. So then they said to him, Ya Aba Sa'id, tahlik wa you're going you're gonna to perish. You're going to become very weak. Third day, he starts fasting again, and his son comes to him. No, his son went to Yahya al Bakka and Thabit al Bunani and Yazid al Dabbi. Maybe they were his father's friends, that's why. His father's associates. He went to those three and he said, Please come and take a look at my father, he's gonna die, he's gonna, he's gonna perish. So they came and they stayed with him and persisted until they got him to at least drink some, I think it's barley water some kind of barley water, some kind of water mixed with something to give him some strength. There's numerous stories like this. I mean, how many do we want to mention? Saying that Ata al-Sulami, again, he, he had a similar kind of situation until he became very weak. So then Salih al-Murri says, I said to him, you've really, really caused yourself so much harm. And I'm going to make something for you now. I'm going to prepare something you and I don't want you because I'm giving you it's hospitality. You're not allowed to reject my hospitality. You're not allowed to deny it. You're not allowed to refuse it. Right? So he said, okay, fine. I agree. So I went and bought some sawiq. Min ajwadi ma wajattu wa samnan. So I went and bought some of this uh, barley mixture. The best that I could find, like the best quality one. And I bought some ghee, uh, this clarified butter. And I made this kind of drink from him from there. I mixed it all together. And uh, I think, no, he made it like into a paste, halwa type. And then I sent it with my son to him, along with a, 
a container of water. And I said to my son, make sure you stay with him until he drinks it. So finally my son came back and he said, yes, he drank it. I wanted to do this for a few days. So the second day I did the same thing. And I told my son again to do the same thing. This time my son came back and he hadn't drank it. He said he didn't drink it. So I berated him quite a bit and I said, Subhanallah. Um, I, no, then he said, I went to him myself. Uh, Ata Sulami. I went to Ata Sulami myself instead of my son, and I said, "You've re- refused my, uh, you know, my my hospitality, and this is actually something that's supposed to be benefiting you. It's supposed to assist you for your prayer." So he gave him this excuse that it's gonna, if you get so weak, you're not gonna be able to pray, and you're not gonna be able to remember Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So then, when he saw that I was angry with him, I was upset with him, he said, "Ya Abu Bishr." Um, Please don't let this make you feel bad. I did drink it the first day you sent it. But on the second day, I felt like I should drink it. But I wasn't able to. Because every time I try to drink it, this verse comes in my mind of Surah Ibrahim, verse 17. They're going to try to drink it, but the death is going to be uh, coming to them from all sides, but they're still not going to die. You know that verse I mentioned? La ilaha illallah. So his friend Salih began to cry. And then he said to him, you know what? You're somewhere else and I'm somewhere else. Like, I, he was trying to understand where he's coming from. Like, you know, if somebody, sometimes somebody does some, enters some kind of diet, they take on a job or something, like, I just can't understand. I know this guy. How is he doing that? Why is he doing that? I can't understand the reasoning for that. So he's saying, Arani fi wadin wa anta fi akhar. I see myself in one valley and you in another valley. Like, I just can't understand you. So again, this wasn't happening to everybody, but this was happening to some people. If this can happen at least once to us, maybe it's a good thing. It'll give us that fear that we need. It looks like this Ata as Sulami, so many people have had this experience with him. And he's giving the same response to everybody. There's another one which is from. Abdul Mu'min al saigh he says that I once invited Rabah al Qaisi to my house one evening. Come to my house to eat. So he came to me at Suhoor time. Maybe this was Ramadan, maybe this was some Suhoor da'wat that he was. I gave him some food, he took a bit of it, and I said, Have some more. I don't think you're satiated. You've not had enough, you just had like a bit, a few morsels. And he shrieked. It caused me to be frightened. It says, كيف أشبع أيام الدنيا وشجرة الزقوم بين يدي بين يدي طعام الأثيم. He said, how can I be satisfied with food? Mashallah, we eat to satisfaction and even more. We eat to satisfaction and even more. You go to a restaurant and the amount that people order, right, and the excess, and generally a lot of the time they waste things. A lot of the time. Okay, you can take maybe some kind of half decent eaten dishes, uh, half left that look decent. But otherwise, a lot of it is. For example, in some restaurants, they give you salad with everything. But they don't eat that salad. Like Turks, they give you salad. Lebanese, they give you salad, bits of salad with everything. Now, how much salad are you going to eat? Why don't you just tell them, stop the salad? People aren't willing to improvise like that. They're not willing to plan. They know they've been to a restaurant so many times. They know that salad is going to be wasted. Or they don't eat tomatoes or tomatoes. Right? But they, they won't say no. It's almost like, let them bring it. I've paid for this. That's why I don't eat out much. But when I do go, I try to be very careful because I don't want the food to be wasted. Right? So especially if you've got experience with a place, you should tell them, look, this is how I want it. Charge me the full amount, this is how I want it. I don't want to waste any money. Because they just do it like standard. They just add all of these flourishes and these... This is all embellishment for them. It's food. It's what gets wasted otherwise. And there's people who would give you an arm and a leg for this, you know, in some countries. And we waste so much. And the statistics show that anyway. And we're part of it. We're part of this waste. So he's saying that, how can I be satisfied in these days of the world when this tree of zakum, which we discussed last time, is constantly in front of me. It's the food of the, the sinners. So then I just said, 
It's like, you know, you're trying to get somebody to eat and you've made this whole biryani, but the guy's on a carb-free diet, he's not going to eat it. It's like, okay, fine. You know, our people, they'll still try to feed you. Like, no, your diet, you know, forget your diet today. They'll give you all sorts of excuses. You're not on a diet right now, right? But finally, he says, I just lifted it up. It's almost like embarrassed. And I said, Anta fi shay, wa nahnu fi shay. Like, you're somewhere else, we're somewhere else. We can't even understand what you're doing. You know, like you invite someone, they don't eat biryani. He's like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you eat biryani? Like, are you crazy? Or it happens with me, they, they produce this best steak, and I'm like, I have a little bit, I'm like, that. I've had enough. I don't like too much meat. Right? And they're like, are you, are you crazy? Like, you know, this is good meat. You know, like, have some more. So, like, I've had enough. I went to a barbecue the other day, I had one piece of chicken, I had one chop, I had one small other piece of meat, and I had, I think it was half a burger, and I just couldn't eat anymore. Like, that's as much meat as I can eat. What, what am I going to do about that? Right. So, um, people think that when they go to a bargain, you must eat, eat, eat meat, like stuff yourself with it. I think the only meat that you, you are actually allowed to stuff yourself with is qurbani meat. That's why Shaykh Zakaria, rahimahullah, I mean, look at the focus on the sunnah. That on the day of Eid al-Adha, which is coming up, on the day of Eid, when they would do the qurbani, the udhiyya, he would actually not eat any bread with it. He'd just eat the meat on that day. But he was not a meat eater. But on this day, because it's hospitality from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go ahead, enjoy yourself. You're going to say, I'm going to do five qurbanis, so that I have that meat for the rest of the year and I'm going to have these barbecues every day or every week. Right, and that's qurbani meat, so it's halal for me. Maybe it is. I mean, it is of course halal. La ilaha illallah. We, we actually, you know, we have to have some kind of semblance of consciousness. We have to have some kind of idea of precaution. Just because Allah has given us money to buy what we want doesn't mean we do that. Buy what you want, but at least don't waste. At least eat in proportion, you know. At least have some kind of concern for the hereafter when you're eating. Enjoy your meal, but at least have some concern. Siwar ibn Abdullah al-Qurayi says, once we were with Umar ibn Dirham. Umar ibn Dirham. Um, it was a coastal area. And he would only eat from night to night. So we came, brought some food. And as he was about to eat, suhoor time, when he heard one of the people doing tahajjud somewhere, Right? He was reciting this, and how often do you think we're going to be exposed to somebody doing tahajjud at a beach? What's the possibility? MashaAllah. And he was reading, Talking about the zakum. And he just fainted. And the morsel that he had in his hand that also fell down. He only, he only regained consciousness after the rising of the sun. Seven days, he didn't eat anything. Every time, after he'd heard this verse, every time somebody would present the food to him, he, he, his, the, the verse would just come back. I don't know, you want to call this OCD? I don't know what you want to call this. He couldn't eat. Eventually, his friends, they all... Uh, basically gathered around him, subhanallah, taqtul nafsak, you're going to kill yourself. And finally they forced him to eat something, so he ate something. Allahu Akbar. Just a few more stories before we end this. Famous Tabi. There were two ways that he could come home from the masjid. Right? There was one of the ways, one of the routes took him past the mountains. Maybe that's where he could get a view of the mountains. When he was returning, when he would return from Maghrib Salat, if he took that mountainous path, he would come and not eat. So why not? Why don't you? When you come through that path, why don't you eat? He said, "You know, when I see those peaks, they're very gloomy at night. You know, when it's dusky, when it's about to sun is about to set, these peaks, the mountain peaks, the mountain tops, they seem kaliha, gloomy. Subhanallah, they look kalihatun." Gloomy, so I can't eat. Like, why not? Because that gloominess reminds him, how, him of gloom mentioned in the Quran. 
which is Surah Al-Mu'minun, verse 104, وَهُمْ فِيهَا كَالِحُونَ They will be gloomy and downcast. He remembers that from the look of the mountains at that sun setting time, at that twilight time. Ajeeb. All of these things remind him of the hereafter. Once Hassan was, rahimahullah, was brought some water so that he can do iftar. These are all iftar. These people are generally fasting anyway. When it was brought close to him, he started crying. He said, why are you crying for? He says, I just remembered the desires of the people of hellfire. Allah says in the Quran, about the people of hellfire, he quotes them. They'll say, Afidu alayna min al ma aw mimma razaqakum Allah. The people of hellfire will say to the people of paradise, pour over us some water or anything of that which Allah has provided you. So all of these things that you have, pour some of that over us. And then they'll be responded to. The response will be, Inna Allah harramahuma ala al kafirin. No, Allah has prohibited these things, made it unlawful for the disbelievers. Even a person like Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, who's one of the Abbasid uh, uh, Umayyad Khalifs, once he drank very nice and cold, cool water. And he just started crying. He said, what's made you cry, Amir al-Mu'mineen? He said, ذَكَرْتُ شِدَّةِ الْعَطْشِ I just remember on the Day of Judgment, when people will be very, very, very thirsty. Then I remembered the people of hellfire, and they won't get any drink. They won't be given anything to drink. It'll be boiling water. They're thirsty. You want cool water. Now imagine if you're thirsty and somebody gives you hot water. It's like, come on. you know. تَجَرَّعُ There'll be boiling water, which they will try to ingest, but they won't be able to ingest it. That's what I remember, and I feel like this. Then there's another one from Ibrahim and Nakhai. He says that every time I read this verse in Surah Al-Saba, verse 54, except that I just remember, it just re recalls for me being refused water. Because this is what's going to happen in the hellfire for the disbelievers. وَحِيلَ بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ مَا يَشْتَهُونَ Surah Al-Saba. There'll be a, a barrier an obstacle placed between them and what they would want, what they would desire. So he says, that's what I feel like. Once Muhammad ibn Mus'ab al-Abid, the, the devotee, he asked for some water. But then they used to have a barrada. A barrada is something that they would use to call the water. Maybe it was some kind of a round pulley kind of thing with ice around it to cool the water. When he heard that sound, was making some kind of strange rumbling sound or whatever it is, grinding sound, I don't know what it was. He shrieked and he said, Min aina laka fin nari barada. Where are you going to find a fridge? In our terms, where are you going to find a fridge in hellfire? And then it reminded him, Wa in yastaghithu yughathu bima in kalmuhun. When they will seek something like this to drink, they'll be given this hot boiling water, this pus stuff to drink. Now, I would say that this does not mean that you need to stop having a cool drink or that you can't enjoy a nice mojito. It's just that when you do enjoy one, remember this, that enjoy the mojito. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's given us this cool, cooled, cooling drink to drink because it's a ni'mah of Allah. It's not haram. It's absolutely halal. It's available to drink. Allah has given it to us. We're allowed to drink it. But just remember by that, that we want to do shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah giving us this. And inshallah, we can also thank Allah and thus avoid doing wrongs so that we don't end up in hellfire. So it's supposed to be like a prevention from sin for us, preventer of sin from us and also thankfulness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it. Because any good that Allah has given us in the world and we thank Allah for it, we fulfilled its right. Then inshallah, it will not be a burden for us. That would be the way that, that would be one of the ways that we can deal with this inshallah. That ends our dars for today. Uh, the next time it finally moves on to the clothing of the people of hellfire. Do they have clothing? What kind of clothing? In it? What kind of a punishment is included in the clothing? That will be discussed insha'Allah next time. So till next time insha'Allah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us through this anyway and to protect us from the hellfire and all that's related there. 
and to make us wise about this. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah khair for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. And if you're finding this useful, you know, um, uh, as they say, do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.